Today we're going to be looking at a channel called Corridor Crew. Specifically this one on VFX Artist Reveals the True Scale of Nuclear Explosion. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's get right into it. This is downtown Los Angeles and I'm going to blow it up with a nuclear bomb. Simulate it, hopefully. Okay, not actually. That would be too expensive, but I am going to use visual effects. Really? That's the first reason? Is it's too expensive? <laughs> not because it would be a horrific act of terrorism? To show you what wow. that would look like. You are very familiar with nuclear weapons. I mean, they're depicted in movies all the time. However, they never Some do a good job of showing what others. actually happens during a nuclear explosion. I mean, this movie would have you believe that you could survive a nuke just by getting in your fridge. That's that one is infamously bad, though the one he showed earlier from Terminator 2 is actually pretty good. How the force works? Even when we look at real test footage, it's still difficult to truly understand the power that's on display. They're always in desolate, remote locations with nothing nearby to visually compare their size to. At least this sure. test in the ocean had battleships for scale. On their own, it's just really hard to grasp the true magnitude of these that was explosions. A crazy Take a look at this shot. If you saw the movie Oppenheimer, then you're already familiar with the first test of a nuclear bomb, Trinity. Sure, it seems powerful, but it's not until I put the 900 foot tall Eiffel Tower next to it that you can begin to grasp its true scale. Now, imagine instead of blowing up this bomb in the desert, it actually blew up in downtown Town Los Angeles. Well, you don't have to imagine Someone this. Someone doesn't like LA. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, Whoa. trust, we'll come back to this in a moment, so stay That's tuned. That's pretty cool. I just wanted to give you some context first, because let's be honest, this is kind of weird. It's hard for me to make a video in my upbeat tone about weapons of mass destruction. So I'm going to focus on the science behind the explosion itself, because that is truly mind-blowing. Let's see how accurate this is. Explosions are actually pretty simple. They're just huge releases of energy over a short amount of time. Now, the vast majority of explosions are the result of chemical reactions, such as the gunpowder that fires bullets or military explosives that use TNT. Cause I'm TNT, I'm dynamite, TNT. That's actually not a bad explanation. It's fairly simple and yeah, that's really all it is. And I win that Okay, quick clarification about TNT and dynamite, because a lot of people seem to think that they're the same thing, but they're not. Dynamite is solidified nitroglycerin, which is very unstable and dangerous. This is not the way you transport nitro- on the other hand, TNT, or tri-nitrotoluene, is so safe and shock resistant that it took 30 years for people to even figure out that it could explode. People used to use it to like, dye their clothes yellow. I'm not kidding. These I days, however, TNT is that. one of the that's, most that's commonly insane. used explosive chemicals in the world. Used for everything from geological surveys to hand grenades. Did you know that hand grenades just have TNT inside of them? Because I didn't. I mean, I do now. <laughs> Me too. Nuclear bombs, however, just hit different. In movies, you can always tell it's a nuke because there's a mushroom cloud. It's a very distinctive shape. However, this shape isn't actually exclusive to nukes. Mushroom clouds occur That's from any true. sufficiently large explosion. It's just how thermals work in the air. In fact, yep, it's really just buoyancy in the air. It's the same principle as to why boats float as to why why the cloud leaves that kind of shape if it's sufficiently large. First documented example of a mushroom cloud is from the 1700s. So how do nukes hit different? Instead of a chemical reaction, it is a nuclear reaction. And thanks to this dude who had special relatives, we have the equation <laughs> E equals relatives. MC squared, That's which basically just means that energy is the same thing as mass. Stuff can be converted into pure energy, and pure energy can be converted back into stuff. So in a nuclear explosion, stuff like uranium ascends beyond its three-dimensional form to become pure energy. And eh, kind of. Um, really, you're not, you're not talking about full annihilation of uranium. That would be like a matter-antimatter -matter annihilation event. So here we're just talking about fission. A neutron splits uranium, and then there's excess energy from that, which is where it comes from. But the uranium isn't gone. It gets turned into fission products and additional neutrons. So 
I guess a better way would be delta mc squared rather than straight up mc squared for this particular reaction. It is a lot, a lot of energy. Yeah, so notice that little c squared from the equation. That stands for the speed of light times the speed of light. So big energy number. is actually equal to the mass of something times 90 quadrillion. You don't need a yeah. lot of mass to equal a lot of energy. For example, a single drop of water has a mass of 0 0.05 grams. It's a tiny, minuscule amount of water. But even converting just this much mass into like energy would yield an explosion as large as the one we saw in Beirut in 2020. Now that's assuming you can convert all of that energy. That's its rest energy, if you will. This tragic accident was one of the most powerful non-nuclear blasts in history. It had enough concussive force to shake the entire country of Lebanon, and yet it- I remember hearing about this, and a lot of- I remember a lot of people asking me if, if it was a nuke, because it was an actual- because it kind of looked like one, but with the, with the mushroom cloud and everything. Still only a 20th the size of the Trinity test. Yeah. While the Beirut explosion was caused by a warehouse full of ammonium you can nitrate, make Trinity was fueled by a core of plutonium just the size of a bowling ball. Nukes release so much energy that a new unit of measurement had to be formed. Two months before Oppenheimer detonated the gadget, they blew up 100 tons of TNT, or 0.1 kilotons. This explosion was literally humanity making a big mark in the earth and going, yep, that's my measuring stick now. And they actually created several new units. Um, you've probably heard of kilotons and megatons, but there's also a shake. Because these nuclear reactions happen so fast, a shake is 10 nanoseconds, or 10 to the minus 8 seconds. So faster than most electronics can pick things up. And by the time you see the explosion, by the time the light travels to your eyeballs, the reaction was ancient history. Another unit is the barn, which is 10 to the minus 24th meters squared. And that has to do with the probability of hitting a, of causing fission in uranium, or really it's just a probability number. 10 to the minus 24 is an absurdly small number, but this we're talking about meters squared, and this is incident per atom. You can fit a lot of atoms in a, in a square meter. So you're playing a very low probability game sextillions of times. Just a few barns, you play it enough, it's going to happen. This is how physicists were able to figure out that the size of the Trinity explosion was the equivalent of 21,000 tons of TNT, or 21 kilotons. But here's something crazy. In 2021, they actually reanalyzed the data and determined that the actual yield of this explosion was 25 kilotons. So, uh, yeah, as if that distinction even matters when you're blowing up a city. Well, it, it actually does, um, because some cities are a lot more sprawling, for one, but also it's interesting because it was so new that measuring might not have been as precise and to the point where margin of error could be on the order of a few kilotons, which, like you said, one kiloton is a lot. It's the equivalent of a sizable bomb in and of itself. Speaking of which... Five, four, three, two, one... First one millionth of a second after nuclear detonation, go. the heat is already so extreme that a ball of plasma forms. It's a fireball so hot, it reduces everything inside it to subatomic particles. So yeah, it mentions in the first millionth. Uh, so yeah, the reaction's already gone. Everything that's fissioned already happened. Fission reactions happen so fast in nuclear weapons. Um, it's what's called um, prompt critical. So you can have prompt neutrons from fission and delayed neutrons for fission. In a nuclear power plant, you're, I guess, less critical is one way of putting it, that it's delayed critical. Prompt neutrons happen on the order of 10 to the minus 10th or even 15th seconds. It, for all intents and purposes, it's instantaneous. But delayed critical, uh, uh, but delayed neutrons happen seconds later. In a nuclear power plant, delayed neutrons, um, a significant fraction of them are delayed, and that is what keeps the unit operating and gives you plenty of time to, res to respond and why it's a very controllable reaction. But if you're making a bomb, your goal is to put the 
put the critical mass in such a configuration that just the prompt neutrons by itself. So each multiplication each multiplication loop rises to immense levels, to dormant, to kilotons, megatons of energy released in the order of a fraction of a second. So yeah, by the time you're at millionth of a second, the reaction is history. Now you're just seeing the after effects. Our star is 15 million degrees Celsius, making it the hottest point in the entire solar system. But for a brief moment in time, it becomes the second hottest point because the core of a nuclear Very fireball brave. can reach 100 million degrees. To put that in perspective, that's 20,000 times hotter than the vaporization point of diamond. One of the now he's talking about the area right and around the bomb. Not that, not the big fireball. The big fireball is not that hot. Otherwise, it would do way more damage than that. But the actual, the very small part that actually fissioned. Now this is, and this is actually a critical component to making a fusion weapon because that that temperature is hot enough to induce fusion. So you put a fission bomb and you layer it in a material that'll fuse such as lithium deuteride, and then you have a, the fission just acts as a trigger for an even bigger bomb on the order of hundreds of kilotons or megatons. Resilient materials in the entire universe. So it doesn't matter if you're in a fridge or a bunker or a bunker made of diamond, if you're inside of this fireball, you will get deleted from existence. You would, but that fireball isn't that hot. I mean, it's, it's hot. It's, it's gonna be on the order of thousands um, but when, when it when it's at this size because it, it rapidly loses heat as it expands but the very center for a very you know brief fraction of a second is that hot but here we're we're down to the order of thousands of degrees still extremely hot but if that would have been at millions of degrees it would have caused far more destruction <laughs> Than wiping out of than wiping out a city. All this heat radiates outward at the speed of light, instantly scorching anything unfortunate enough to be within view. This real test footage shows the paint getting vaporized at the moment of detonation. It's quite literally a laser engraver, but like everywhere. And that is a key point. The thermal pulse, which travels outward, um, is going to give everything. Is going to burn everything if you happen to be within that third degree burns, and that is before the shock wave hits you. That's an important point to bring up, that that travels at light speed, but the rest of it is just, is gonna be merely uh, supersonic. Anything combustible immediately ignites on fire, including everything within a mile of this explosion. All the people within a mile and a half would receive third degree burns. It's a burn so bad you don't even feel it. And Looking at this test footage, what I find fascinating is that it's not actually windy. What we're seeing is the heat of the nuke pushing the smoke away like it's the solar wind or something. Yeah. It's just that intense. The real wind and the most devastation is still to come. The shockwave is a sphere the of high pressure air that expands outward faster than the speed of sound. In fact, this shockwave is so powerful it levels up into something pulse. even deadlier. When it hits the ground, it reflects back up to recombine with itself, forming what's called a mock stem. It gives the shockwave a razor's edge, shaving the city down to rubble. It's been a few seconds at this point, but the explosion is still happening! Now what he's talking about, now that bit is why airburst explosives are so much more effective at destroying lots of buildings. If this was a surface detonation, you wouldn't have that effect because it wouldn't merge with itself again. It would be just on the ground, or at least not as much. I mean, it'll, it'll, kick, up some, it'll kick up some debris, but a ground detonation, the bigger hazard is contamination from the fallout, whereas a, a, uh, an airburst detonation is a lot of that fallout is just going to be blown away up into the atmosphere and diluted very heavily, which is why radiation poisoning contamination from Hiroshima and Nagasaki was horrific, but it could have been way, way worse if it was a surface detonation. Shockwave leaves behind a pressure vacuum, which sucks all the air back in with hurricane force winds. It's not as strong oh, yeah. as the initial shockwave, but this is more insidious. The initial shockwave was on the order of many thousands of mile per hour winds but this one is so this is comparatively smaller but yeah the air rushes back into the city it delivers fresh oxygen to all of the all the fire the rushing air feeds the flames which create fire tornadoes that swell to hundreds of feet high this terrifying reality that 
Okay, some of, I mean, I guess it's possible if you hit like an oil refinery with this or something where there's a lot of flammable material there, but a lot of that kind of depends on what's going on in the target. He probably referenced um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki as an example. Those were, those cities were quite flammable. Um, fire coating wasn't what it was <laughs> back in the 1940s, but um, a modern city, a, a typical modern city, I don't, know, I don't know if you'd see fire tornadoes unless you happen to hit it in like a cluster of gas stations or something, but a lot of that kind of depends depends on the target and how much flammable material is down there. It's called a firestorm and is exactly what happened to Hiroshima. Yes. It was a city made almost that, entirely of wood. Now that happened, of wood. again, yes. That's the key point. The city was made mostly out of wood. ...explosion so that we can separate the physics of nukes from the lives they've taken. But I don't think I can do that. Separating the science from the deaths? It's impossible. Nukes are not fun. They're weapons. I mean, you, you technically could, but I, I get what he's saying. I'm 100% in the support of peaceful uses of nuclear technology, like building nuclear power plants that are safe, sustainable, and drive human progress. Not a weapons guy. ...of war and the devastation they've caused isn't something we should ever ignore or ever forget. Especially because this one was a small nuke. One other thing to point out is the fire bombings of Japanese cities did a comparable amount of damage in terms of these firestorms, fire tornadoes, that sort of thing. Again, not to diminish the impact of the nuclear weapons, but it certainly wasn't the only time um, bombing of civilians happened during the war. That you know, was one of the reasons why World War II was the, the most deadly conflict, and a lot of it being civilian deaths. World War II may have ended, but the Cold War had just begun. It was an arms race between America and Russia to build bigger and bigger bombs, such as the B-83. It's the most powerful nuke in America's arsenal right now, and yet physically, it's not that big. It's 12 feet long. In fact it's an interesting uh, replica right there. Um, Note that he said right now, more, there were more powerful nukes in the U.S. arsenal and even more, pow and even more powerful nukes in the Soviet arsenal. The warhead itself is just right up here at the front. For something so small, how powerful could it be? 1,200 kilotons. Yeah, this is a megaton bomb. I'm using a tool called Nuke Maps. If you just Google search Nuke Maps, I've, I've used this tool just before. Just plug in the warhead yield of your choice, whether or not it's detonating on the surface or if it's an airburst. And then you just hit detonate. This is the fireball. This is the strongest part of the shock this is wave. A cool and effect. this signifies where everyone gets third degree burns. This is what the Trinity explosion would look like in downtown LA. But if I put in the B 83 of 1200 kilotons, that detonation would look like this. It's like almost two miles wide. Just yeah, the fireball. Just the now, the B 83 is just the most powerful nuke that we currently have in our arsenal. Again, one thing to point out is while well, that's interesting, is the, uh, the third degree burn zone is the outer radius, but it happens at about the same time as the fireball. I mean, granted, ancient history compared to the nuclear reaction, but just because the speed of light travels way faster than the speed of sound. But considering how short of a range that is, it might as well be instantaneous to an observer. We've tested many more powerful nukes. For instance, the Russians tested the Tsar Bomba, which was a 50 megaton bomb. And this would literally destroy the entirety of Los Angeles. Now that, um, clearly a propaganda weapon, and it was huge. It would be very easy to intercept because at, le at least at the time in the 1960s, uh, no, no missile could, could carry it. That bomb couldn't even fit in the bomb bay. So this is a big, juicy radar cross-section for interceptors, and they only had one of those, and again, it was for propaganda purposes. So while this is impressive, you'd never see something like this used at scale in a nuclear war. I just turned on the casualties. Estimated casualties are about 3 million people. Instantly. I think there's a good reason yeah. why people don't normally think about this stuff. Going back to the B-83, yes, this is smaller, but we built 650. There are 650 of these things just out there in the world somewhere. That is enough. And 
that is less than it used to be, which is which is the real crazy part. To scorch every single square inch of California. Yeah. Are you scared yet? I am. We don't need 650 of these bombs. I mean, whether or not we need them at all <laughs> okay, is a separate conversation, silly. but 650? I think we can all agree that is too many. Mutually assured destruction is still assured destruction, but thankfully there is hope. Both the US and Russia have reduced their nuclear stockpile by yeah. 50,000 warheads since the height of the Cold War. Think about that for a moment. Two nations with a history of animosity and distrust were able to set aside their fear of each other and put most of their weapons That's down. Silly with the when nerf I see gun. that, I don't see a species trying to destroy themselves. I see a species with a reason to save themselves. And that gives me hope. We need more of that for the safety of us all. But thanks for watching. That was a pretty good illustration things and it and actually pretty good for uh, someone who's no, who's not a subject matter expert that was uh i like it when they show those uh those visualizations like that it really kind of puts things more in perspective and it was really cool seeing those animations thank you very much for watching i'll see you next time